Welcome to the Cups of Consciousness show. I am Alea Dow, your host. I'm a doctor of oriental medicine, a sound healer, the author and founder of the Seven Cups of Consciousness. I have produced nine sound healing albums and have recorded over 2,000 meditations online. I am an energy practitioner and help people shift their consciousness using their energetic fields. And this show is all about using your energetic fields to shift your consciousness as well as exploring energetic concepts that help you create a more empowered and connected life. This episode is an energetic session that explores concepts, energetic practices, and protocols that are similar to a prayer, which help you transform particular aspects of your life. When you listen, recognize that some part of you is using your energetic fields to shift your vibration, which in turn shifts your consciousness, your behaviors, your beliefs, how you react and respond. You might even go into an altered state, so use caution if you're driving or doing something that requires a focused mind. With all of this work that I present, remember that it is your energy shifting you in your own unique way. That way you stay in control and empower with your process. So take a deep breath in. Pull yourself into your line of light and explore your inner terrain in a safe and supported space. Let's dive in. Welcome to Alea's Cups of Consciousness podcast. I am taking some time today to interview Mir, who is an amazing practitioner. He is has incredible gifts and has been doing this work for a long time. He's trained in a lot of different modalities. Mir, thank you so much for being on the show. Thank you very much for inviting me. It's a great pleasure to be here with you. Tell us a little bit about yourself and kind of how you began your journey, your training, where you live at this time, and what you're doing. I've been practicing spirituality for the last 20 years. I studied different modalities, started with ancient teachings and now more modern uh, teachings. I mean, how I started, because I actually, I spirituality was always in my life from a little age. I had some... Uh, gifts which at that time i was not calling gift obviously (laughs) some differences uniqueness uh, from other kids like perceiving seeing hearing other dimensions getting information just uh, utilizing higher realms which i was not aware at that time obviously and trying to understand myself trying to understand my differences brought me into spirituality And for the last 20 years, I studied spirituality just to understand myself better and just to balance my energy, just to ground and really understand what is going on in the world, what is going on in other dimensions and eventually in myself as well. So I started spirituality to use it for myself. But in the last 15 years, I'm also uh, teaching spirituality, doing one-to-one sessions, group sessions and classes as well. Beautiful. And when you were younger and you talk about your differences did you perceive them as your challenges your gifts like what was your experience with that high level of sensitivity for your own self i mean uh looking back then obviously they were challenges for me they were very challenging because now after many years of work i understand how concepts are but at that time it was challenging because first of all, I'm very sensitive. I'm still very sensitive. I feel energies, other people's emotions, thoughts, feelings, even the things happening in the collective consciousness or the things that will happen in the future. All of them come and create some sort of tension, fatigue, anxiety, other forms of problems. Now I know that they are just indicators of something to be shifted, to be clean, to be looked at. Or they're just signs saying that, hey, there's something else here. Look and send information to that people or just understand what's going on. Adjust your energy fields and move on. But obviously back then they were very difficult for, first of all, they were scary (laughs) because I didn't have lots of support mechanism around me to understand these things. They were scary and uh, also they were quite disorienting. And for a long time, actually, I tried to, to close my gifts i never wanted to use them i suppressed them and it worked for a while but after a while they wanted to come to the surface and at that time i didn't resist and i started studying spirituality because before that i studied uh, 
business. I worked in the business field. I worked in finance. But at one point in time, which I can call an enlightenment experience, I said, a kind of burnout, I say, I can't do this thing anymore. I can't do this office job. I'm so overwhelmed with everything. So that was a burnout moment. But now looking back, then I can say that was an enlightenment moment. All those gifts came to the surface. So and universe was giving to a message. This is what you need to do. And then you need to start in one way or another. That's so interesting that that burnout kind of created that that turning point. Yeah, that burnout like... created fuel for me to open up. Yeah. yeah. Because I'm also I'm also quite shy. I don't like showing myself outside too much because these spiritual trainings I got, I studied, I had gifts, everything, but my friends, my colleagues were saying, why don't you do this thing? Why don't you reach out? But no, 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 I'm not good at it. No, no, I don't want people to know these things. They like, might judge me or I can't do this thing. I'm not good enough. So many years also with you, by the way, together we work lots of the, about trusting yourself, valuing yourself. So those are issues that I worked through many years to say that, yeah, I'm doing this thing. Yeah, I'm teaching. I'm doing classes. I'm working with clients. So it was a journey for me as well to accept this and then coming in front of people, giving a class or doing private sessions as well. But now looking back then, I'm saying, thanks God I did this. Well, and all of those challenges gave you this high level of compassion so that when you are working with people, you understand the challenges that they are experiencing, that it's it's not just an easy fix of like, okay, mm-hmm. just snap your fingers and just think differently. Mm-hmm. And so that gives you a level of patience to be able to hold a container for people as they go through their own journey. And on that note, what are the common sources of challenges that you find when you're working with people? Like when people come to you, what are their what are their core challenges that you're able to help them with? What are the sources of core challenges that people experience? From my understanding, there are three main sources of a challenge. The first one is empathic. It means that we are running other people's stuff, issues, challenges, karma, toes, emotions, and thinking that they are our own issues, which is usually 80% of the issues that we are experiencing are not ours. It can be partner, family, children, friends, even the collective consciousness of a country or humanity. And we say that, oh, I'm having this thing. I have these, these, these challenges. Sometimes, most of the time, actually 80% of the time, we take other people's issues as a way of connecting to them or as a way of belonging or In order to be valued, look, I'm taking everybody's issues to be transformed so that people will value me now. Or safety, saying, "Mm, let me try, let me feel how it feels, these things, so that I can prepare myself and I can be safe. So those are all unhealthy mechanisms we use to take other people's challenges, issues on ourselves. But obviously it doesn't work because we can never shift another person's issue We can never change anybody's reality. We can only change our reality and model the solution, send information. So instead of uh, doing things for people, we just teach them how to do this thing, which is more empowering, more sustainable. So this is the first thing, actually. And 80% of the time, this is the root of a challenge, I would say, empathic. The second layer that I see about challenges is the unmet needs. We have lots of needs, souls, bodies, like safety, freedom, compassion, humility, self-value, self-love. We have lots of needs. When we expect other people or external world to meet our needs, then universe shows us, no, it doesn't work like this. For example, we usually attract things to our life, which uh, are mechanisms to learn. For example, we want to cultivate more freedom inside as a soul or a body. We say that, okay, in this lifetime, one of our spiritual lessons is freedom. Fine. We want to have more freedom in this lifetime. Usually, universe brings us situations where we are not free. 
We might be stuck in a job. We might be stuck in financial challenges. We might be stuck in a relationship. Many different layers can be. But in a way, we cannot find that freedom in the external world. So what universe is telling is, go inside. Amplify the freedom inside. Cultivate more freedom internally. And then fire the external world, other people, to teach you this lesson. You feel free inside. And then you free, you're free, and the external world will give you this freedom because whatever you hold inside will be reflected to your external world. So we usually, usually what we do, what we want, opposite of what we want, actually. Just this is the second thing, unmet needs and trying to meet our needs externally rather than finding them inside of us. Because just a little note there, even cultivating the needs inside is good, but those needs are already there because we are the part of divine. We, we have a divine spark, a divine is inside of us. So when we say divine, divine is complete, whole. There's no lack inside. Freedom is there, safety is there, everything is there. The thing is, rather than amplifying, just even acknowledging what it is running inside. And then we don't expect anything external world. And then things start to come to you. So this is how uh, I can define unmet needs. And the third thing is unresolved wound from the past. Traumas, challenges, things happened in the past, which were not healed in the appropriate time. Come to this moment, either physical challenges or challenges in the external world. To say that, hey, I'm here, I'm still here. Just bring some light on me. Please resolve me so that you'll be free, I'll be free. So these, that's, that's very uh, interesting, actually. When these things come to the surface, they usually come as subtle signs. When we don't notice them, it becomes stronger, stronger, stronger. Until we say, ah, okay, there's an issue in the past. Let's resolve this thing. Let's seal this thing. Get the spiritual lesson there and then move on. So this is the third one. So to sum up, there are three main sources of a challenge. It can be empathic, which means it others other, which belongs to other people. It can be unmet needs, trying to meet our needs externally, or it can be unresolved wounds from the past. These are the three main sources that I see when I work with clients. Very wise concepts. Thank and you. With that, when you're working with people, how do you find that root challenge? Um, when I work with people, I usually use clairvoyance and clairaudience, the gifts that I had from my little age. What I do is I set up a safe space, call in the guides, standard masters, and call the guides of the person that I'm working with. And then ask the guys, okay, what is the issue here? What is the challenge and what is the solution of this challenge? Then I scan the energy fields of a person and then I then, oh, okay, there's this thing here. And then I ask the guys, is it appropriate for this person to bring this to the surface at this moment in time? Because sometimes we see things, but it's not appropriate for that person at that moment. I double check with the guys. If they say, okay, I share the information with the client, explain and ask if it resonates. And if I say, if I hear yes, then I do energetic protocols to shift that issue. Who and what are your guides and how can that help you shift issues, challenges? How do you use guides to help people clear their, their blocks? My guides are uh, ascended masters, angelic ones, beings on the other side, love and light. So those are my guides. Before starting a session, I call in my guides, ask them really guidance. The first thing I ask them, please hold a safe space for me and for the client, because only when we are safe, we can shift. When they set up the safe space, I ask guides. I will do a session here in the physical realm, but please hold, please send information to this person. Please work with this person in the higher realms. So I might be doing a session. They might be helping that person in a very different way, far beyond the mind. So this is how I work with the guides. 
And um, guides generally, to answer this question, who are the guides? Everybody has guides. Guides help us to move through this journey, but they don't do things for us. They just model the solution to us. They just show you the way. They just send us information saying, if you walk like this, it will be more supportive for you. But the choice is yours because we always have free will. And guys, will never override our free will and will never override our spiritual growth and evolution. So this is my understanding of working with guides. They don't disempower. No, they don't disempower. They don't override our free will means that if we don't ask, they will never uh, do anything. When we ask, the best way to ask is, my guy, spiritual advisors, I have this challenge, this issue. Can you model the solution to me? They will do it straight away. They will send you information. They will model the solution. And most of the time, people will not get it like, oh, okay, they told me this thing or they hear this thing. Because some of my clients asking why I can't hear like this. Not necessarily, because through the higher self, in a different dimension, they send you the solution. And maybe after a couple of days, a couple of weeks, oh, okay, this is the solution. You come up with a solution. Actually, it's coming from the guides. But it just filters through your mind, through your subconscious mind, and comes to your conscious mind. So that's how I see guides. So that's really interesting because I've worked with, you know, beings in other dimensions, guides for a long time, as have you. And when you've connected with people's guides, no, not so much yours, because your guides, you're very clear, like they are the ascended masters, high beings of light, really healthy, co-creative. Have you ever worked with guides? who are attached and wanting for the person that they are overseeing. Mm -hmm. I did actually, I had uh, some, in some instances while I was doing sessions, I'm working with a client, some of the guys coming and saying, we want a session as well. Ah. <laughs> so, because for example, I'm sharing these concepts to a client and guys said, oh, but I'm, not, I'm doing something different. I'm working with this person different. I said, okay, then, okay, we are doing a session with the client, but then use this protocol, use this concept, lovely guide to take your responsibility back to yourself, return that person's responsibility back because there's an energetic entanglement. And that's why that person cannot shift. Sometimes it actually happens when a client comes the issue is with the guide, not the client. So in some occasions, it's not common, but some occasions this thing happens as well. Guides that are attached to shift people's realities. So you're helping guides move into a greater degree of empowerment, healthy relationship, not disempowering the person that they're overseeing. Yeah, because we are having our spiritual journey. Guides are also having their spiritual journey as well. So everything in the universe evolves to oneness, evolves back to the creator of all that is. So any being that we see is moving, moving, moving to a higher level of connection with the creator. This is what I see. Beautiful. And on that, on that note, when you're talking about guides and the creator, how do you define a multidimensional experience, existence, reality? From my understanding, everything existing in this world or in other planets, everything that is created, I would say, has a divine spark in the heart of the source, creator, creator of all that is, however you name it. Just a spark in the heart of the source, maybe just the thought of the creator in the heart of the source. From that spark, different dimensions, we reflect, ripple and reflect ourselves. And physical dimension is one of them. In higher dimensions, we have energetic aspects. For example, what we call higher self, which is a wise part of us in a different dimension, a higher floor that has more information about than our mind. We have different energetic aspects in different realms, but ultimately everything reflects from our divine spark that resides in the heart of source. And this physical reality is just a reflection and how I use multidimensional reality or using my multidimensional aspects. It is like, um, it's like looking, looking at a mirror. If we try to change the image on the mirror, that will never work. We change 
us and the reflection will change as well. Or if we try to change something on the computer screen, it will never work. The, the real issue is on the hard drive. So everything that we see in the physical world is a reflection. Utilizing our multidimensional aspect help us to shift things first in another dimension and then reflect it here to the physical world. So, which is an easy and quick way for shifting things. So I use it like that, actually, multidimensional being. In that vein of using other dimensions to shift your reality, what is your most favorite, powerful practice tool that you utilize for yourself and for your clients? Usually, sometimes, uh, sometimes, but not sometimes, actually, usually what I do is I ask my guides to do a session to me. I have an issue. I say, guides, I couldn't resolve this issue. Do a session to me. Let me see which techniques you are using. Let me see your approach so that when I need this thing in the future, I can use it on myself and for my clients. Just observing. They are doing their session. They are doing their protocols. I'm listening to them. Okay, you resolve this thing like this. Okay, next time when I encounter a challenge like this, I will use this one. So my favorite tool is asking my guys to do a session on myself. Beautiful. I love that. That's so great. Um, what are the common sources? Because a lot of people are pretty challenged right now in the world with all the mm -hmm. things that are happening, understandably so. And anxiety and depression is a big deal. A lot of mm -hmm. people have it. And what are the common sources that you find with that anxiety and depression? I mean, both of them, both anxiety and depression, the first layer I check is empathic sensitivity, empathic reactivity, empathic sensitivity. The things that we are feeling, the things that are disturbing us, really ours, or we are feeling something else outside of ourselves, other people, collective consciousness. Because when I go anxiety, depression, insomnia, myself, sometimes I experience, the first thing I check, does it is it really mine? Because I'm super sensitive, I feel lots of things. Or it is something else. For me, it's 97% something else. But everybody this is different but for myself 97 percent something else it comes so this is the first layer with clients as well i check for depression and anxiety is it really yours or you're feeling something else empathically second thing i would say for depression it is a mechanism let's say an unhealthy mechanism to connect to your essence in a deeper way so withdrawing from the external world from the people we love going inwards it's an unhealthy mechanism to connect to your essence in a deeper way. So this is how I see the layers about depression. The best way to do this thing is doing this in a conscious way every single day. Taking a deep breath, pulling your energy and awareness into your divine line, and then really feeling your essence, feeling the qualities there, feeling the purity there, feeling the love there, feeling the gentleness there feeling all the qualities that you have acquired throughout lifetimes, just deeply valuing them, deeply connecting to them, deeply loving them. And when we do this every day, we connect to our essence deeper and deeper, and we don't need to use the mechanism of depression or anxiety or fatigue or any other thing. So this is the one of the basic practices that I do every day for myself. Obviously, for depression and anxiety, there are other layers which are individual we look at in private sessions. But this is the layer that I see about depression. When it comes to anxiety, again, the first layer I always check is empathic sensitivity. The other layer about anxiety is control. Trying to control the external world, placing our control chips externally in order to feel safe. So control and safe are the key words for anxiety. But the thing is that we can never control in the external world. Whatever we do, external world, things happen. The only thing we can control is how we hold ourselves, how we perceive things. And the more safety we cultivate internally, the safer we feel internally, the more safety we get from our mastery, wisdom, our essence. 
we will not need to control the things in the external world. We will keep our hands to ourselves. We will keep all our attachment to ourselves. We only attach to ourselves. Then there won't be any need to control because life flows in the external world and our essence flows vertically. The more we listen our essence, we don't need to listen what is flowing externally. This doesn't mean that we're drawing from the life and closing the ourselves. We are still in the life, but we are listening a different station, different radio station, while still being physically present here. So this is a layer about, uh, I can say, anxiety, control safety issues. And with that anxiety and depression, that can also sometimes lead to insomnia. And insomnia. and insomnia, as you mentioned, could be empathic. But what are other ways to resolve that insom- insomnia that can also tie into nightmares? Insomnia and nightmare. These are issues that many of us experience, I experience from time to time as well. The first layer about this empathic, we again check are these issues belong to us or we are feeling somebody else, something else. So this is the first layer. We clear this layer. If still it doesn't shift, insomnia and nightmares, both of them, I can say that. When a soul and body evolves, comes to a certain level of evolution, then she wants to serve, to be in service to humanity, to be in service to people. And what happens is that when you go to sleep, sometimes soul and body go to discordant dimensions trying to shift them, trying to bring light to those dimensions, trying to take responsibility for shifting those dimensions. And then this creates fatigue, insomnia, nightmares. And literally it means that you do overtime during your sleep. You work very hard in the higher realms and discordant dimensions. Solution for this, what I do for myself is, before going to bed, setting an intention. I keep my energy on my divine line, firmly attaching my divine line to the front of my body's spine, and only and only hold my energy in harmonious dimensions, beautiful, clean, clear dimensions, never going to discordant dimensions. Ah, if you want to do service, you're in your beautiful, high floor, clean dimension, sending information to other dimensions that needs to shift. Sending information, modeling solution, just, uh, and also another thing is you can make a request to the angelic ones of love and light to work with those dimensions. You just make a request, but you don't do the work yourself. You never get attached to those discordant dimensions. You don't take responsibility to shift any of those pieces. So that is the way that I can say to have a clean, clear container while you're sleeping. And when you think about somebody who's super sensitive, right, they might have anxiety, depression, nightmares, insomnia, they are highly sensitive. What are core practices that somebody who is highly sensitive could use to maintain balance, to move back into balance, peace and calm? When you're highly sensitive, how can you balance your energy? For that, The first piece is always be attached to yourself. Get your hands off of everyone and everything, your energetic hands, keep them on yourself. Be only attached to yourself. Second layer is return any bundle, any responsibility that you've been carrying that belongs to others. Return all these pieces back with appropriate energetic information. Send information, model the solution. Because this is an old way of service is I take this person's stuff and transform on myself. With the current energy of the planet, this doesn't work anymore. The most empowering way is return responsibility. Put the information inside. It's like a it's like a uh, like a nice package. Imagine like you're making a gift, putting the solution inside and returning back to the person. So return the responsibilities, return empathic sensations. The third layer is retrieve your mastery, wisdom, gifts, your protection, your support off of everyone and everything because they only work for you. They never work for anyone else, those pieces. 
retrieve them, wrap them around you, have strong coherent fields. And the fourth layer is compassion, means that respect, honor everybody's journey. That person can be in a discordant behavior, can shift, cannot shift, good person, bad person. This is not up to us to judge anybody's journey. People can live in a way that they choose and also which is appropriate for their spiritual journey. What we can do is we are never attached, sending information, modeling the solution, and this is the service that we can do. So if you follow these steps, even daily, because I do myself daily as well, this clearing empathic sensitivity, you will feel clean, clear, more balanced, and more connected to your essence. And then you also create that beautiful, strong, coherent field, and you positively, empathically impact other people. Yes, when we shift 300,000 people positively, empathically affected by that. So that's what I know. That's why it's always important to be in our own power, never giving our power away, never giving our resources away, never giving our creative energy away, and never taking anybody's resource power away. That's why uh, when I work with clients, I always say, neither me, nor a guide, nor an angel, anything will shift you. None of us will bring a miracle or a quick fix to anything. We're just working on the issue here, exploring the layers, pondering the solution. And the rest is yours. You use your energy fields, your higher self, to shift, to grow. And there's no rush. It might take one year, it might take three years, it might take 30 years. Things will shift gradually. And I always believe, for myself, it worked like this. Things move gradually, not instantly. So that is the thing I always tell my clients. Patience, patience, patience. Self-work, responsibility, working on your issues. I'm modeling a solution to you. And this is a journey, not a quick fix. Spirituality and spiritual practices. This is what I believe. Very wise concepts and tools. Um, with all of these pieces, if somebody wanted to explore more about you and possibly even book a session, where could they find you? I'm now a Seven Cups of Consciousness practitioner. So aleada.com. If you go to the if you go to aleada.com and book a session there. You go to practitioners and you can find my profile there and you can book a session with me and then we can explore these issues and these concepts for your issues. If they work or not, we can see together. We can explore these concepts together. And there's something that I just want to complete our show with. And I have worked with you for many years. And as a Seven Cups of Consciousness practitioner, there's a gift that you have that's really extraordinary. And that is your incredible capacity to clearly tune in to people's guides and hear their wisdom that then helps guide the person in the physical dimension. It's like you're this incredibly clear radio station channel that gets these profound messages that help people, empower people, and clear away the mist. Thank you so much for joining me for this podcast, Mir. Thank you and very much. It was a pleasure. It was a joy. And thank you for sharing all of your beautiful insights, concepts, practices, and tools with us in the audience. Thank oh. you very much. Thank you. You have been listening to the Cups of Consciousness show with me, Alea Dow. Receive a free month of the Cups of Consciousness. Go to sevencupsofconsciousness.com. When you get your free month, you will get five cups a week for four weeks. You'll also receive access to a live tall cup of consciousness session. Feel free to review the show. Thank you so much for listening, and we'll see you next time. Aho.